Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a psychiatrist based in London. And I'm in conversation today with Professor Robert Bohr, who is a clinical and specialist aviation psychologist, and he's co-edited with Todd Hubbard the key book on the subject of pilot mental health. And that's entitled Aviation Mental Health, Psychological Implications for Air Transportation. Now the reason I'm talking to Professor Robert Bohr right now is that the main theory surrounding the disappearance of the Malaysian Airlines jet at this moment in time is that the pilots may have been involved in some kind of suicidal act. So I want to ask you, Professor Bohr, a little bit about what we know about pilots and suicide. Um, from your book, it looks like if a pilot is going to kill themselves using an aeroplane, they're much more likely to be a private pilot with a private pilot's license than a commercial pilot. Raj, yes, that's uh, completely correct. I mean, pilot, let's put it in perspective. Pilot suicide is incredibly rare. I, I think if we look at pilots and compare them with any other occupational group, uh, the risk of any self-injurious behavior probably is at the lowest in this occupational group. Um, part of the reason for that is most pilots are fairly strong-minded people. They have a will to live. They have missions to complete. They're fairly technically minded, um, and there are many other psychological aspects or constructs that would uh, perhaps reduce uh, th their susceptibility. That said, um, it is a phenomenon that has been studied and recorded now for many years. Um, data is collected both in the European region as well as in North America uh, amongst both commercial and uh, private pilots, and yes, there are incidents and cases of private pilots who uh, do end their life uh, via the, the means of uh, flying a plane into the ground, into the sea. Um, again, it is very rare. Amongst commercial pilots, it's far rarer. Firstly, um, uh, as we well know, uh, all pilots are scrutinized very, very closely every single day they are on the job and probably several times in the course of their uh, work. They go through a number of different checks, security checks. Um, the person sitting next to them is watching their behavior very closely. They have medical checks at least twice a year. Um, and their performance is being monitored actually by computers uh, and other systems. Um, that said, it does very rarely but occasionally happen. Um, the cases that we're aware of in, in the last uh, few years uh, perhaps are Egypt Air, which although is uh, still slightly inconclusive, is almost certainly a pilot suicide. This was around 12, 13 years ago. Um, there was a case of a single pilot who uh, took an Air Botswana flight um, after being diagnosed with a serious illness and told that he wouldn't be able to fly, um, took this flight against authority and crashed it uh, into uh, the ground at, at an airport in Botswana, killing himself. Fortunately, that was the only person. Um, and then the, the, the cases tend to be either when the, the pilot has a grudge against their employer um, or when there is something about their personal life, such as financial hardship, um, romantic um, difficulties, uh, perhaps a serious illness that is likely to prompt this. But uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, it is incredibly rare. Let's just talk about what we know in general about suicide. Um, suicide um, can be impulsive, but if a commercial pilot is going to execute themselves using the jet, surely that has to be a pretty planned uh, activity and therefore the plan would have been hatched a long time back before the actual flight. What are your thoughts about that? Almost certainly so. Um, obviously uh, you know, we will never have access to the mind of the person who is uh, feeling suicidal, acts on their uh, suicidal impulses. Um, but if we look at cases of suicide, both obviously with pilots and uh, with others who sadly succeed, um, we will see a, a series of footprints, footsteps along the way that would indicate the person is thinking about this, troubled by something, and making active plans. It would be, it, it, some people will discuss it with those around them. Um, it's quite rare in, in the very few pilot cases that we are um, aware of where, where that has actually happened. 
So that is correct. You're not going to wake up one morning or impulsively whilst grabbing the controls of an aircraft, uh, plunge it into the ground. This is something that is usually premeditated. And certainly if we link that theory to the Malaysian air um, disaster, we there have been a number of um, aspects to this flight and its profile that would probably suggest that uh, that it would be very unlikely to have been an impulsive act. Uh, we, we know a few things, which are that um, some of the um, uh, systems for um, communication were switched off. Uh, we certainly are aware that the flight deviated in its path. Um, it appears that it did not move violently through the air, which is quite important. If there was a resting for controls, you would expect uh, profound fluctuations in the altitude of the plane and, and it's in its flight profile. So um, if, and, and we really must qualify here, if this is a pilot suicide, it almost certainly would have been premeditated and very carefully planned. Um, uh, whether it was both pilots acting together, if that is the theory to be followed at the moment, by the way, that would be unprecedented in, in my understanding and knowledge of this area. If ever there's been a pilot suicide, it's been a single pilot on their own. Um, the, the idea of two acting together um, to create this outcome, I, I've certainly never come across that. So if this was um, someone who over a period of time developed um, a suicidal motivation and carefully plan this and, and as you say it would have required careful planning in terms of switching various systems off in the aircraft and various other aspects in order to execute this then their mental state would have changed from a long time back and I think you're also arguing that this becomes another difficulty with this theory because pilots are under very close scrutiny as you've said before so you're arguing it would have been very difficult for this person to become aberrant in some way and it's not picked up by colleagues or the medical, regular medical examinations that commercial pilots undergo. Is, is that the gist of your argument? Very much so. I look, we, we best not be conclusive about it because the evidence I think does become clearer, I can't say day by day, it's a very slow and painstaking um, inquiry and investigation this, this whole uh, situation. Um, but almost certainly, uh, the and, and, and I think all of us have seen the, the footage on television of the pilots going through the security checks at uh, Kuala Lumpur Airport. Um, and, you know, I think even just to the untrained eye, you can see two people going about their business. We see these sorts of behaviors in everyday uh, situations in airports. Uh, people perhaps taking off uh, metal objects, placing them in a tray, going through the metal detectors and other detectors and so on. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be anything untoward or abnormal about the behavior. Uh, and almost certainly those pilots would have gone through a number of other security checks along the way. They cannot board the aircraft without uh, firstly uh, encountering the gate crew. The plane has to be handed to them by ground crew and a flight dispatcher. Uh, again, if anything untoward was there or if the wrong information were loaded into the uh, computers, this is likely to be detected or checked at least by the other pilot. Um, it, it seems uh, very, pretty much implausible uh, that the pilot would have got through all of these checks and been able to uh, succeed in, in committing suicide in this way. Um, we, we obviously uh, must expect that, you know, within uh, perhaps hours or at least a day of this uh, incident, the psychological profiles um, and training history of these pilots would have been very, very carefully gone through. Um, police would have attended the person's um, living quarters, they would have started to interview very close people to them, they would very closely scrutinize financial transactions, bank accounts and so on. They will be speaking to their doctors to see if they obtain medication for any particular other reasons. And all of these things um, will add up to a particular profile of someone, if indeed they are suicidal, to somebody who's in trouble. But um, the, the information that we get so far is that uh, nothing untoward uh, has appeared on, on the psychological radar screens.
Okay, let's take a look in a little bit more detail at one of the examples of the of the flights that you've mentioned, which is the Air Botswana disaster, which occurred in 1999. Because I think that's a very interesting example, which highlights how people would be looking at the Malaysian Airlines scenario. The first thing is that there was a definite life event in the life of this pilot, which was that some significant health event was detected and he was grounded. So we got a very clear life event which led to him being very upset and what, what people would be looking for if this is a, a suicidal act is a life event of some description. Isn't that right? Yes, very much. I mean, uh, everyone in their life proceeds in a particular course. It may not be a direct one. It may be slightly uh, stochastic and uh, we all have our bumps and scrapes in life. But when somebody is becoming suicidal, there are quite a number of different areas that are likely to stack up. And what is very important is that the person feels hopeless about their situation. Um, so whatever the difficulties and challenges they have in their life, if they see no way ahead, uh, this may be one of their considerations. Again, it's rare with pilots um, because they tend not to be impulsive if we look at their psychological profiles. Pilots tend to uh, carefully weigh up um, the, uh, the evidence in a particular situation and to act usually in, in a purposeful and positive way. Um, we would also expect a change in mood which would be detectable by other people. Either somebody who's quite euphoric because they are either at peace with the decision that they have made or they are noticeably depressed in some kind of way. Um, and it is possible, though not always the case, that they will have mentioned this to, to others around. And, you know, on all of these fronts so far, we appear to be drawing a blank. Um, and obviously, as, as mentioned, we can't access their minds, although um, if the plane's wreckage is discovered and the, um, the black box, as it's called, is able to be retrieved, the parameters of this flight will be downloaded and every aspect of the, um, the flight will be able to be analyzed, certainly in its last 30 minutes at least. And the behavior of the aircraft, if we can call it that, will reflect something about the mind of the pilot. Are they wrestling with hijackers? Are they fighting with each other? Are there voices uh, on the flight deck? Is anyone praying, um, or perhaps saying a final prayer before dying? Is this um, something that is as the result of suicide, or is it just the acceptance that the plane has become uncontrollable? We don't know, but that's where the next level of evidence will, uh, will need to be sought. Okay, and staying with the Air Botswana situation, apparently this pilot is reported to have um, threatened suicide long before uh, going up an aeroplane, or or immediately after the life event. So there's a there's a there's an expression of threat which doesn't appear to have happened in, in the uh, Malaysian Airlines situation. Then he steals the aeroplane because he's grounded. He's not really allowed to be flying. He steals the aeroplane, and while in the air, um, argues with the tower um, uh, and is disgruntled and has grievances and even threatens to fly the plane into the headquarters of the Air Botswana. Um, airline company, but runs out of petrol apparently and, and crashes uh, the plane into some other jets uh, on the um, airdrome. So this notion of a grievance against the company um, is highlighted in this incident and would be the kind of thing, if there's going to be a motivator for a pilot to, uh, of a commercial airline to do this sort of thing, that would be a key motivation, isn't that right? Yes, that's very much the case. Um, I think with the Air Botswana incident, uh, it reminds us a bit about the psychology of uh, accidents and human error. And that is um, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor James Reason at Manchester University, was uh, absolutely instrumental in devising a, a theory, a way of understanding how organizational accidents take place. And uh, one could argue that the Air Botswana uh, incident was actually an organizational accident. By that, James Reason um, argued that a number of gateways were ignored or somehow overcome, uh, leading to a much worse outcome. So, for example, the question must arise, how come uh, this particular pilot's mental state and threats were not identified and recognized and dealt with at an earlier point? 
A further point would be how come the airport authorities allowed him even to board the aircraft? Uh, why was his um, company identification not removed from him? How would he gain access to the aircraft? And how would he even be able to taxi the aircraft and take off, etc.? So a number of, I think, warning signs or points at which the incident could have been prevented from escalating were either ignored or dealt with very poorly on, on, in that particular incident. Here with uh, the Malaysian air disaster, we're not altogether sure because we don't know at what points things have gone wrong other than they seem to be going wrong once the flight was underway. Um, there doesn't appear, from the best, to the best of our knowledge, to have been any precursor, any early warning sign with this pilot, though. Um, again, we must add that uh, you know, most of us have access to what is in the public domain. Uh, it is possible that the airline or the medical authorities in Malaysia or indeed you know, you know, one of some satellite uh, information is available to other people but not yet made public knowledge. Okay, let's talk about another famous incident uh, in aviation history, which again may or may not cast light on what happened with the Malaysian Airlines flight. This is a Federal Express cargo flight flying across the USA in 1994, where uh, again an, an employee who is disgruntled and um, is facing disciplinary action because of being accused of lying, so he's in trouble with the company. He boards the flight as a passenger. It's a cargo jet, though, but he's a, an employee with the company, so he's allowed to do this. He's carrying a case of hammers and also, I think, a spare gun. His plan is to kill and beat up the other crew and crash the plane. Um, he's using hammers because he calculates that the injuries on the crew will look like they occurred as a result of the plane's collision. Um, and then his family will be able to get 2.5 million US dollars from the Federal Express standard life insurance policy. So there's an, there's an element of suicide, but there's an element of extortion. Um, and, and a criminal element to this particular case. Any thoughts about it and, and, and what it tells us about what's possible? Well, I think two things. Uh, firstly, this precedes 9-11, so in terms of the chronology, uh, that is important because um, safety and security on board aircraft and at airports, as, as we all know and we experience when we go flying these days, uh, is considerably different. It would be unusual, if not um, an aberration, for a passenger to get on board an aircraft nowadays uh, with anything that could be used to commit serious harm. That said, I don't know how many passengers are aware of this people who travel. There is an axe on board every flight deck of a commercial plane. Um, obviously, it's behind the locked doors where the uh, pilots sit, and that's obviously there for an emergency in order to if necessary, chop away at bits of the aircraft if, the, if none of the doors would open or chutes were to deploy. But uh, yes, I, I think to return to the main part of the question, the, um, the issue there of intent and uh, the link to, uh, to suicide there is an interesting one. Um, certainly this is uh, the case in non-aviation uh, situations as well, and that is sometimes people will end their life either as an act of altruism or because there is some greater benefit or gain. The problem uh, in the airline industry is because safety is so critical to uh, airline operations, in any incident, let alone an accident, and 100% if it's a fatal accident, is going to be so thoroughly investigated that it, it's almost certain that the intentions of the pilot will then become clear because the Federal Express uh, situation, the pilot had taken out life insurance within the previous year, and that would have become uh, apparent as the police and the accident investigators went through the uh, financial records of this particular uh, chap. So what is important here is that although people think they may be killing or breaking up or destroying the evidence, in all likelihood there is going to be some um, pattern that will emerge in another area which will give away perhaps their true intent and therefore suicide does not necessarily cover your tracks. So one final question and it may be an unfair and perhaps slightly mischievous question but um, as a psychologist who is interested in and involved in the aviation industry do you think airlines and the industry in general use psychology enough? Um, 
because there often is a gulf between what we know is going on in psychological research and, and what academic psychologists understand of the mind and brain and, and the commercial sector and their ability to engage with that. And also my experience of working with doctors, and doctors are pilots are quite similar people, is there tends to be a rather macho view um, that psychology is a bit feminine, a bit wussy, and therefore they tend to be suspicious of, of um, psychologists being brought in. And as a result, they don't really embrace it and they keep it at arm's length. Um, and is that, is that an issue, do you think, in the industry? Well, that, that's a very good question. I, I think that uh, certainly historically there is a culture of people being um, uh, having perhaps quite negative views of psychology. Um, I, for one, at times, you know, am mindful of its limitations. It's not a, you know, we like to think of it as a science, but after all, it's not a pure science. Not we can't always predict behaviour. Um, for pilots, and uh, that's both commercial and military pilots, and I certainly do some work in the Royal Air Force, um, I think that there is more respect for uh, psychology and psychologists who have a clear and deep understanding of um, aircraft and uh, aviation operations. Um, I think that there tends to be um, a, a perhaps a denigrating and perhaps uh, also a fear of psychology or psychologists um, who have no background in aviation, don't understand how planes fly, how pilots might think and so on. Um, I think psychologists have something of themselves to blame in this. Uh, the, if you read some of the literature in this particular area, um, we see psychology being used in ergonomics, that is the design of a flight deck, um, we see how psychology is used to select out, and I emphasize select out pilots from operations rather than to select them in. Very often pilots are asked to do lots of psychological testing. They're not given very useful or full fee feedback about what they've just been through. So I think psychology can up its game and we can become more sensitive to the needs and understanding uh, of, of what pilots require. Um, but I do think that we can improve psychology as well because um, only uh, three years ago, I think it is now, we had the JetBlue incident where the pilot literally went psychotic. Um, it was a very difficult, very sad incident. Um, I was involved with the uh, Federal Aviation Administration in the United States um, Committee uh, where we looked at the mental health criteria of airline pilots and our, our best conclusion on all of that is these are incredibly rare exceptional events and we should not change all the rules for licensing on the basis of one event. What we might need to do though is to evening um, of pilots when uh, their medical examiners assess them every six months and uh, we also need to provide better in-house psychological support for pilots. Pilots are like the rest of us. We're you know, doctors, psychologists, other professionals. We all have stresses uh, and so on. By the way, I, you know, in our understanding, pilots seem to uh, cope with these perhaps better than uh, doctors and psychologists even. But nonetheless, they are discouraged from taking any personal problems off to a professional because this could count against them. The act of going to seek help of any kind could invalidate their license. And when you need to hang on to your job, uh, that is not a very strong incentive uh, if you are worried that it can count against you. So we might need to liberalize um, our views about pilots who do have psychological issues. And indeed, the Canadians, and to some extent, the Europeans will soon be taking a lead on this, as they will probably be um, accepting pilots who uh, are taking certain kind of uh, medications, particularly an SSRI, some antidepressants and so on, provided they are stable and under good psychiatric care, there should be no reason that that person cannot fly an aircraft. And that's certainly a very positive uh, step forward. So, Professor Robert Bohr, thank you very much indeed. And Robert Bohr's book is entitled Aviation Mental Health, Psychological Implications for Air Transportation. It's published by Ashgate and it's co-edited with Todd Hubbard. Professor Robert Bohr, thank you very much. Thank you, Raj.